Hi everyone, welcome to episode eight of the Property Investing Podcast brought to you by Real Estate Investor. I'm Dennis Wong and thank you for tuning in. For new listeners, you're welcome to access previous episodes by visiting our blog at blog.realestateinvestor.com.au and on the right hand side under topics, select podcast and then every episode will appear. Now in this podcast, I'm going to be joined by Anthony Tassone, who is going to give us some insight into what is involved in land purchases and I'll also address a couple of frequently asked questions from investors. So let's get straight into this episode. In this episode, I wanted to give you the listeners some basic information when it comes to purchasing land. Now, purchasing a block of land gives a buyer options in terms of what they want to build and the power to have more input in the designs compared to buying an existing property or from a developer. So now I'd like to welcome Anthony Tassoni, who is our Property Acquisitions Manager here at Real Estate Investor. So welcome along, Anthony. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Dennis. So look, I guess first off, for those looking at purchasing land, how would one choose the right block of land? Uh, Well, we're looking at a block of land for um, any purpose, really, but for investment purpose, um, you need to factor in what you can build on the land. Um, The... um, the factors that will affect that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, would be the uh, the size and the dimensions of the block. Yep. Um, obviously, if you've got a small block, you you can't build a big house, um, yep. especially if you want to keep it as a single story house. Um, certain um, local environmental plans. So depending on where you're building, um, there will be uh, maximum site coverages that you have to work within. Um, so a common one would be about sixty percent. Yep. So if you're looking to build um, a house on, say, a 275, which is a small um, block, a 275 square meter block, the maximum house size would be about 165 square meters. Okay. Um, uh, you know, in line with that 60% site coverage. Um, so you want to make sure that you've got something that uh, that you can build within the site coverage, what you're after. Yep. Um, and uh, when it comes to dimensions, uh, you want to factor in if you've got a narrow block, it might lead to a less conventional design. Yep. Um, a, a narrow home um, might be a little bit pokey to be, um, you know, living in or, or renting out. And then that could affect your uh, value on resale. Okay. Um, another thing um, would be not to discount the aspect of the block and the livability of a, of a block which has um, good exposure to the uh, northerly aspect, um, being in the southern hemisphere, obviously we get a lot of sun from, yep. from the north. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, being able to angle your living areas um, of your design towards the north is very important. Um, the, uh, the other things to, to keep in mind would be the contours of the block, um, as well as uh, easements and any services um, that uh, that provide for the block. So when you build your house, you got to connect it to the sewer, stormwater, yep. all that sort of thing. Um, easements will affect what you can build and where as well. Um, sometimes there are overland easements or um, easements for drainage and that yep. sort of thing. Um, when you're building over some easements, you need to encase them. So if there's a you know like a a, a sewer pipe going through underground. Um, you'll need to encase that when you build over it, so that'll affect your build cost. Yep. Um, and when it comes to contours, as I mentioned before, um, the the contours can also affect um, the design of your home and the type of uh, footings that you need for it. Okay. So be it a split level type of home or slab on ground, um, and and also the usability usability of your backyard. So if you've got a fairly level building pad or where you intend on building your house is flat and then the backyard just falls off to a cliff, mm-hmm. um, that uh, makes it a less usable block yep. um, for the residents and uh, anyone looking to buy later on. Um, and, and finally, um, now there are a million different things, but I'll just keep it short, I guess. But uh, finally, whether or not the land is, is registered or unregistered. Um, so, um, you know, registered being that it's complete now yep. and unregistered, uh, you know, due to be complete and titled at a later date. Okay, so, so what is the process when you are purchasing vacant, uh, vacant land that's not yet registered or titled? Yep, so, so what that um, essentially means is that you're, uh, you're buying a promise. Um, so the, the contract is for a block of land to be delivered in line with uh, certain requirements. So, um, you know, the, the, um, the specific boundaries of the block um, and, and they're all detailed in, um, in the contract. Um, but yeah, you're buying a block of land where the uh, civil works have not yet completed. So it's an off the plan purchase, essentially. Okay. If you were say buying a unit, um, in inner city Sydney, 
that has not yet been completed. Yep. Um, that you know you're you're buying a unit that um, based on certain plans. Okay. So um, in this instance, you'll be working off uh, some plans called so you know to be able to assess the size and the dimensions and everything that we just spoke about. You'd be um, having a look at the disclosure plans or engineering plans. Um, they they call them different things, um, but uh, once you've got that information, you can uh, start to assess. Uh, how much it's going to cost you to build on it um, and what you can build on it. Um, and, uh, and there are a couple of things that uh, in these types of off-the-plan contracts um, that uh, can mean if the, you know, th- that you don't proceed with it, essentially, um, just as a bit of a safety net. Yep. Um, one of those things is um, so you're committing now to buying a block of land later on, but they don't deliver it within a certain time frame. That time frame is set by um, a date called a sunset date or sunset clause in mm-hmm. the contract. So um, let's say it's uh, 12 months from the date of contract. If the land has not uh, had titles issued on it within 12 months, then either the purchaser or the, the vendor can pull out of the contract. Yep. So that's one common clause that you'll find in these sorts of contracts. Um, and, uh, and the other is um, usually there's uh, a, a small allowance for any variation to what they told you would be delivered. Mm. Um, so uh, that variation is usually around 5%, it could yep. be more or less. Um, but, you know, if the size of the block or, or certain aspects of the block vary to, within, uh, to outside of that percentage, um, the, the purchaser can pull out of the contract. Okay. Okay. Um, but that aside, um, you're buying something that... Um, you are committing to purchasing something at a future date um, and uh, you need to make sure that you have your finance in order so that, you know, if it's six months away, Mm -hmm. um, you have extended finance if that's possible to get. Otherwise, you will have to reapply for finance at a later date. Yep. Um, But uh, there are positives and negatives that come with that. Um, So so the positive, um, the plus side would be you basically at first pick of the lot um, the land hasn't yet been completed, but if you you know have a look at your disclosures and you read and you find what you think is the right block, you'll be the first one to get in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, before a lot of the others. Yep. Um, and uh, and the other thing is um, also you usually get it for a bit of a discount. Okay. Um, so developers um, who are um, you know developing the land yes uh, will be willing to sell it for a little bit less when it's um, you know uh, in its further, first stages in its first and early stages. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so I guess once you've acquired the land, then what do you need to do before you can start building on it? Yep. So um, before you start building, you do need to get approvals. Um, so there are two stages to that. And the first is um, the preparation of the final working drawings. Um, so you will already have some preliminary working drawings um, that are done by the builder. Um, and uh, as once the land has uh, titled and it's all ready to go, um, if you're purchasing off the plan, um, so unregistered land, um, if you're buying registered, it's all ready to go from the start. Um, but basically, um, a surveyor will go out there and assess the boundary and the contours of the block um, so that it's exactly as it has been constructed, rather than just what you've been, you know, what you've been told, which you yeah. could vary slightly from. Um, and uh, also, a geotechnical engineer goes there and does a soil test. Um, between uh, with all that information. Um, you'll be able to determine the type of slab or, or footings that are going to be used for the house to be built on, yep. um, as well as the location of the house on the block. So exactly where it lines up to the millimetre from each boundary. Um, and that will help you uh, determine uh, the services and where they need to go from and to with plumbing and that sort of thing okay. yep. um, in, in basically connecting your, your home to the grid. Um, and, uh, and then once, once you've got that information, uh, the second step is, is stage is actually getting that approval. So the full working drawings are then compiled and sent to council and private certifiers. Um, the council will determine whether or not it fits within their planning scheme. Mm-hmm. Um, and private certifiers, um, you know, check it all over with the building codes and make sure that it is being built to, um, you know, Australian codes and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so, uh, once that's all been signed off, you're ready to go. Uh, but keep in mind, just for a standard house, that could take four to six weeks. If you're doing something a little bit bigger, say a um, duplex or, or mm. multi-unit, um, then that gets a lot more complex and can take up to 12 weeks. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, and if, if you don't get a favourable outcome, there's always the uh, option to go back to council or to, sorry, to um, 
basically uh, go to land environment court of, yep. the, of the state that you're in yep. um, and uh, and go against that that uh, decision. Okay. But then it really comes down to how deep your pockets are and no one wants to go there. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you, you try and get that all sorted out and, uh, and ticked off yeah, straight away beforehand. Um, but that's it. Once you've got that, you're ready to go. So, yeah. Um, yeah, once you sit on the land, that could be between the time taken to prepare the final working drawings and get the approvals. You could be looking at about eight weeks or so, or okay. somewhere between six to 12 weeks. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Anthony. Look, I'm sure you can, can talk a lot more about uh, uh, all the ins and outs. But uh, look, for our, our listeners, I'm sure that's given them some insights into what they need to consider when purchasing land. So if you have any questions at all, uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch uh, with us. Next, I'd like to address a couple of frequently asked questions that we get from investors. The first question is, what happens if negative gearing is abolished? Well, there's just under 2 million property investors and a lot of these investors, I'm sure, are taking advantage of negative gearing and there'll be a lot of backlash should this happen or any changes are made. Now, for those old enough to remember, Paul Keating actually removed the right to claim interest losses from rental properties against a person's income, and it actually caused problems with the rental market when investors started to sell off their properties. Now, the government at the time reintroduced it pretty quickly, so I don't believe it's something that you'll need to worry about. Question two, should I invest close to where I live? Well, personally, when investing, you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket, and it's wise to spread your risk because if you have all your properties in the one area and the market drops in value, then your whole portfolio will as well. If there is suddenly a lot of rental properties available, then you may run the risk of having your properties vacant, which means no rental income at all. So it's smarter to invest in different areas and even in different property types so you're not relying on one market. Finally, question three, what if I can't find a tenant for our investment property? So look, there are generally two reasons for a lack of tenant interest. The asking rent is too high or the property is in a bad location. So if you can't find a tenant, then the simple answer really is to lower the rent until a tenant comes along. You know, having a good property manager will also help and advise other options you could try, such as your first one or two weeks rent is free. You know, try other marketing tactics to to, to get some attention. Professional photos will also help attract uh, potential tenants and it's better to lower the rent to get income than having your property vacant for a long period of time. Now you can always increase it in future when the tenancy renewal is up. So make sure the property is clean, tidy and ready for new tenants to move in. You know, first impressions will make a huge difference and you don't want people turning up on an inspection seeing the place in a mess. You want them to be able to picture themselves living there so make sure it's in a good shape. Now, if you have any other questions you'd like answered in one of our future podcasts, please send us your questions to info at realestateinvestor.com.au. Well, thank you very much for tuning into another episode. Don't forget if you'd like any more information or need any help with your property investing journeys, Real Estate Investor is running live events at the end of this month. So if you want to learn how to replace your income through property, jump on our website and you can secure your free tickets. So we'll be in Melbourne, Parramatta, Sydney and Brisbane. So jump online for dates and time. So we hope to see you there. And until our next episode of Property Investing, happy investing and I'll catch you next time.